Hi, boys and girls. So we're going to read chapter 11 today of What Could Go Wrong. I knew Charlie and Eddie were posted somewhere they could see me, though just before I took my seat, I'd looked around and wasn't able to spot them. So remember, she's getting set out as the bait with her bag for the men to come up to her so they can catch them. I imagined Eddie having a hunger attack and sneaking off to buy a bag of potato chips. The boys had agreed to put their bags into a locker, so I knew Eddie didn't have his own food supply handy. Or maybe both of them would go to use the bathroom, leaving me to deal with whatever happened by myself. I'd never felt more alone. Maybe Dad had been right about this trip. If either one of us had guessed what might happen, I wouldn't be here now. I'd always liked reading about scary adventures, but this wasn't any fun at all. A few people were beginning to drift into the departure area, which we had, which had practically been empty when I sat down, and I saw by the TV screen that a flight to New York was due to leave from this gate in 55 minutes. At least that meant I wasn't entirely alone, but maybe that would mean the enemy would, wouldn't try to steal my bag either if people were watching. I wasn't sure if that made me feel better or worse. I wanted to catch those men and see them punished for what they'd done to a helpless old lady. But my skin crawled at the idea of them coming up behind me. How did I know if they'd settle for taking my bag? If they'd made Mrs. Basker go with them by threatening her with a weapon, or maybe they'd do the same thing to me. And then where would Charlie's plan end? What if Hawaiian shirt or Mr. Upton held me hostage in order to get away with something really valuable? Of course, I didn't have anything really valuable. Would they be so angry when they found that out that they'd hurt me? to keep me from describing them to the police who would investigate when they found my, my body just lying there like Mrs. Basker's in some deserted area, except that instead of a bruise, I'd have a hole in my head. Someone walked past my chair and brushed a suitcase against my shoulder, and I nearly flew apart. Sorry, the man said and kept on going. He was no one I'd ever seen before. It was several minutes before my heartbeat slowed down to normal. Gracie, you have more imagination than is good for you, Dad said to me sometimes, and I began to think he was right. Usually I enjoyed my imagination. It was fun to make up stories and pretend to be someone I wasn't, but under the present circumstances, it only made me more scared to think of the things that could go wrong with Charlie's plan. Please, Aunt Molly, I begged silently, come soon. Come and get us out of here. But Aunt Molly didn't come. Time dragged. I decided I'd go crazy if I didn't try to find something to occupy my mind besides fantasies of being kidnapped or hurt. I was still carrying that book I'd brought from home. I decided not to empty my own things out of my bag if anything really happened. I was sure Dad or Aunt Molly would pay to replace its contents. I reached over from my bag, hoping Charlie wouldn't later say I'd spooked the enemy just before they reached for it and took out the book. I couldn't read, though. On page three, I realized I didn't have any idea what I had read, so I dropped the book back into the bag. So she's trying to keep herself busy and occupied, so she decides to take out one of her books from her bag and try to read to herself, but she realizes she's just, like, looking at the words. She's not really, like, thinking about what's happening in the story. I even repositioned the bag candles to make it easier for someone to grab it, and I took out the folded newspaper instead. So remember the newspaper that she grabbed from Mrs. Basker and they were she wanted to work on the crossword puzzle later but she had noticed that someone else had already started to um, fill in some of the crossword puzzle so this is now showing up again she finally grabbed that newspaper out of the bag maybe I could do the crossword puzzle grandma said it calmed her nerves to work on crosswords my nerves sure needed calming it felt as if eyes were boring into the back of my head so it felt like someone was staring at her from behind I couldn't stand it and pretended to drop my pencil. I even kicked it so it rolled away from me. When I got up to retrieve it, I glanced behind me. There was no sign of either of the men who might have been following us. There was no sign of Charlie or Eddie either. If I had ever found out they've gone away and left me alone, even for a minute, I'll kill them both, I thought grimly. I sat down again and opened the newspaper, found the puzzle, and refolded the paper into quarters to start working on it. So she folded it into four. Someone had already filled in some of the middle part, so I started up at the top. One across. Cracker. Example. In five letters. So that's the clue that the crossword puzzle gave her. So there's some sort of word that has to do with cracker, and she has to fill it in in five letters. I remembered that one from one of Grandma's puzzles. W-A-F-E-R. Wafer. I wrote in. I wrote in. 
So wafer is another word for cracker that's five letters long. The PA system made an announcement and I realized I hadn't been paying attention when they came to the part about using one of the white courtesy telephones. My heart leaped. Aunt Molly, had they said Molly? The message was repeated. Will Dennis Malloy go to the nearest white courtesy telephone, please? Deflated, I slumped in my seat. If Aunt Molly had any idea what we were going through, I thought she'd leave her friend in the hands of doctors and call the police to meet her here at the airport, siren screaming. Except, of course, that the enemy hadn't done anything since we left Portland to be arrested for. So far. I tried to go back to the puzzle. 22 across. Stanley Gardner in four letters. I know that one because my dad's a Perry Mason fan, and I read the book sometimes, too. I wrote in E-A-R-L, Earl, then erased it and changed it to E-R-L-E. -E. That meant, I thought, trying to concentrate, the 18 down. German for Mr., in four letters was her, H-E-R-R. -R. So again, these are clues the crossword puzzle is giving, and she knows the different words for these clues. The next one had me stymied, Miss Pickle, in three letters. M Miss Pickle, what the heck was that? It sounded like somebody made a mistake making a pickle, but <laughs> I never heard of anything like that. I decided to skip that one and pick something that tied into the words Hawaiian shirt had already written in. So remember, the man in the Hawaiian shirt had already started to fill this in. Her suit in five letters. Wasn't that hairy? Or only it didn't fit because where I needed an R, there was an X. I stared at the word the original owner of the paper had penciled in. It was supposed to be obliterate. So the word was supposed to be the word obliterate which I was pretty sure meant erase. But what Hawaiian shirt had written in didn't make any sense. It was a jumble of meaningless letters and numbers. I never saw numbers in a crossword puzzle before, not unless they were written out. I suppose I could erase, obliterate the wrong things that were written in. I turned the pencil upside down and scrubbed out a couple of the numbers and then felt a surge of fear as I both saw and heard my blue flight bag go skittering across the floor away from me. Charlie had told me not to look around if I thought the enemy was stealing my bag because the idea was to let him get away with it, but I couldn't help it. I turned my head in time to see a young man in jeans, athletic shoes, and a yellow t-shirt with blue letters that said, Go Seahawks on it, picking up the bag and bringing it back to me. Sorry, he said, and dropped it beside my chair before he hurried away. With that shirt, he had to be from Seattle, I figured, which could mean he was connected with the enemy who had come from there. But he didn't seem to be trying to steal anything. His Nikes were about size 13s, and the bag was sticking out too far. He just caught his foot in the straps and kicked it before he could stop. So she's like, eh, this kid probably has nothing to do with these guys. Like, he just has really big feet, and my bag was, like, way out there. I repositioned the bag, my chest hurting from the tension. Darn Charlie and his stupid ideas anyway. I gave up the idea of trying to do a stupid puzzle that someone else had already spoiled. I decided I'd better keep the telephone number Aunt Molly had given me in case I had to call it again. So I tore off the edge of the newspaper and stuck the scrap with the writing on it in the pocket of my jeans. Then I refolded the newspaper and stuck it back in the outside pocket of the flight bag. How long was I supposed to sit here like this with nothing happening except that I was scared out of my wits? I looked around hoping to spot Charlie and tell him I'd had it with this pl it, that his plan wasn't working and that he'd have to think of something else. And then something did happen. I saw him coming across the expanse of polished tile straight at me. The man in a Hawaiian shirt. I sucked in a sharp breath, <gasps> frantically searching for Charlie. Where was he? How far away had he, and, had he gone to make themselves in inconspicuous? Then I spotted Eddie, sitting on the floor, quite away down the building near another boarding area, his back against a pillar. He was facing straight this way. But the trouble was, he didn't see either me or the enemy because he was reading a comic book and he didn't look up. I'd have been angry, but I was too scared. There was no doubt about it. The man I was afraid of was coming right to me and there was no sign of Charlie or any of the security men. I gulped and tried to think what to do. If I screamed, would the people around me come to my rescue? Or would they pretend it had nothing to do with them and ignore it even if the enemy started to drag me away? I didn't even know if I could scream. My mouth felt the way it had the time I was being initiated into one of Charlie's clubs when I'd been blindfolded and told I was going to have to swallow a cock, 
have to swallow cod liver oil. I hated cod liver oil and I braced myself for it and vowed I'd get even later. Instead, they'd stuck a spoonful of feathers in my mouth. For a minute, I thought I'd choke on them or suffocate before I got them all off my tongue. The enemy had arrived. He came right up to me, but he didn't try to make, he didn't try to take my bag. His face was ugly and he was angry. I think you took something of mine, he said to my astonishment. You stole my newspaper. My jaw dropped open. My scream faded into a whimper. Where was Charlie? What was I supposed to do now? I tried to speak and at first all I could do was squeak. I, I thought you were through with it, I finally managed. Well, I wasn't, so I'd like it back. He didn't wait for me to reply. He simply bent over and pulled the folded paper out of the, uh, out of the pocket of my flight bag and slapped it against his thigh. For a minute, I thought maybe he was going to slap me with it. Next time, he said in a menacing manner, keep your hands off other people's belongings. But, but I thought you'd thrown it away. I didn't know you were coming back. I, I hadn't stuttered since I had speech therapy in the second grade. It didn't matter. He wasn't listening anyway. He turned around and walked away, leaving me dazed. He hadn't struck me. He hadn't thre threatened me with a weapon. He hadn't even stolen my flight bag. Was it all over now? Was this all that was going to happen? I was shaking and angry. I still didn't see Charlie, but when I turned, Eddie was there. He was staring at me with his mouth open. What happened? He demanded. What did it look like? I asked, sounding waspy. Waspy. He said I stole his paper and he wanted it back, so he took it. What were you doing when he came up to me? He could have, he could have stabbed me or anything. He didn't have a knife, Eddie protested. He didn't hurt you, but he could have. Fat lot of good you, you and Charlie were, I cried, feeling near tears I struggled to control. As upset as I was, I knew I'd never live it down if I bawled about it. So she's trying not to cry. And then I saw Charlie coming. I guess he'd been crouched behind a, a divider at one of the adjoining boarding gates, and he didn't seem in the least perturbed. You okay, Gracie? What did he say to you? I was trying to calm down. Where were you? Why didn't you come to my rescue the way you were supposed to? Charlie fell into his reasonable voice. He didn't touch you, didn't take anything except the newspaper that was really was his, after all. I couldn't call a security officer for that, and what good would it have done for me to walk out and confront him? I couldn't very well demand that he let you keep the paper, could I? You could have given me a little moral support, I blurted. I was scared to death. You did great, Gracie. Didn't she, Eddie? Only we didn't get any evidence that he's done anything wrong. That seemed to be his main concern. I don't care about him anymore. Let's try and call Aunt Molly again. See if she's at her friend's or has gone home or what. I wish I knew which hospital she took her friend to and I'd call her there. I want to get out of here. Yeah, okay, maybe you're right. Let's go back to the phones, Charlie said, giving in. Why did he want the newspaper? Eddie wondered as we walked toward the bank of telephones. I mean, did he fly all the way here from Seattle just to get back a newspaper? He could have bought another paper there a lot cheaper. Charlie stopped walking to look at him with admiration. Eddie, that's a good thought. I mean, I'm sure he had a better reason for flying to San Francisco, but what was so important about the paper? And if he saw you picking it up, Gracie, why didn't he say something at that time? He wasn't anywhere around when I picked it up, I said. I looked for him, to be sure. How do you know you weren't, you were the one, how did he know you were the one who had it then? Charlie chewed speculatively on his lower lip. If he didn't see you pick it up. She had the top of the paper with the name on it, Seattle Times, sticking out over the edge of the, of the pocket on the bag, Eddie offered. Sure, but plenty of people on Flight 211 had newspapers, and probably most of them were copies of the Seattle Times. And if all he wanted was the news, he could have bought a copy of the San Francisco Chronicle right there. He gestured out a vending rack of papers. Who knows? I dug into my pocket for the scrap of paper that had the telephone number on it. Maybe he wanted to finish his crossword puzzle, the, though he's not very good at them. And that was when it hit me. The boys said afterward that I went so pale they thought I was going to faint. What? Charlie asked when I sagged against the side of the phone cubicle. What's the matter? Are you sick? Maybe, I said weakly. I mean, I think I know why he wanted the paper back. Sort of. It was because of the crossword puzzle. Oh, come on, Charlie began, but I waved him into silence. 
He'd done part of the puzzle, I said, only he didn't put in the right letters for the words it called for. I didn't notice what he'd filled in until I tried to do some of the other spaces and they didn't match up with what he had written. Some of his fill-ins weren't even letters. They were mostly numbers. There was a noise and movement around us, but it was as if we were in a cocoon of our own, a bubble that shut out everything but the three of us. He left the paper on his seat on purpose, Charlie said slowly, for somebody else to pick up because there was a message in it, in the crossword puzzle. And then we all three spoke together. Even Eddie figured it out. In code, we said, a message in code. And that's the end of chapter 11.